What makes Valparaiso unique is that it's a small town in the middle of a cornfield. But you can hop on a train and be in Chicago in 35 minutes. You can also go eight minutes north and be at Indiana Dunes National Park uh, on a beach. It's got a nice downtown. People are friendly. It's a good place to uh, raise. Sense of trusting. Something happened that put a crack in that trust. A story that if I picked it up off the shelf and read it in here, I wouldn't have believed was true. Anybody who can kill another human being is just an evil person. Oh my God, what, what is happening? It was a terrifying feeling knowing somebody was missing. All this just pointed that this wasn't a normal burglary. That was like the first time I really understood like what like evil people were. I remember my husband keeping his gun loaded. I was terrified that somebody was going to come. This was like my mom's dream home. I was sitting on 99. I was 12 years old. It was a nice, quiet day. Towards the evening, um, as the sun was setting, there was a thunderstorm rolling in. And my family and I, we always would sit on our front porch and watch the storm come in. So that's how we spent our evening after dinner. All of a sudden, about 9, 9.30 at night, Robert, our next door neighbor, comes home. He goes into his garage. He then comes out a few moments later, had seen Lori, his wife. My dad and Bob were standing, like, right here, like, far enough away that my mom and I on the porch couldn't hear anything. You could see in his face he was worried about something. Then they decided it was best to contact the police department. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, it appears as though we've been broken into here. My wife is not here. I guess I, I need a sheriff here right away. There's some blood here, and there's a there's some piece of paper here with a note on it, and my wife's not here. I came home, and the garage door was open, and something is wrong. Something just happened there. OK. I was the detective sergeant with the Porter County Sheriff's Department at the time. I was the junior person in the bureau. I was only in investigations for maybe three, four years. The Sheriff's Department received a call of a potential kidnapping burglary at the Kirkley resident. Patrol units met Robert Kirkley out in front of the house who explained to them that he had come home from his job in South Bend, Indiana. And that was when Todd Schellenberger arrived at the scene. I was deputy prosecuting attorney in Porter County, Indiana, where the crime occurred. And from that day forward, I, I worked intensively on this case every day. This is the garage door that was open when Bob Kirkley got home. Lori's vehicle, a green-colored SUV, not here. Concerned just seeing that before he even gets out of his own car. When you walked inside the house, one of the first things your eyes hit, uh, poster board paper taped to the surface inside the house, and it says, 
44 Magnum pointed at your head, get down on your stomach. That's enough for anyone to conclude something's really wrong. The house had been somewhat ransacked and signs of a struggle in the kitchen. There were red droplets on the counter that if Robert Kirkley found a manila envelope lying on the floor by the front door. And inside the envelope was a typewritten letter. And it said, Larry, they are showing house at 3 p.m. Hopefully, they'll make it a quickie. You need to get in and out quickly. The husband works late, but I'm not sure what time the wife will be home, so hurry. Get at least a computer, stereo, VCR, telescope, the bikes, jewelry, and any money lying around. And in parentheses, he had the wife is cute, check for lingerie. Sorry about the skips after the K's, but I had to use an old computer, not mine. Good luck, Norm Jacobs. Robert said that he didn't know anybody named Norm Jacobs. He and Lori had recently put the house up for sale because they were planning to move to South Bend, which is where he worked at. There was a realtor box on the front door that contained a house key so that the realtors could access the home. Robert told us that there were numerous items that were left behind that Lori never would have left. Her purse was there. Her glasses were there. One we're looking over the kitchen. And one of the investigators looked under the stove, thought he saw something in there, stuck a yardstick under there and slid it through. Out pops an eyeglass lens so that we now know that she doesn't have any eyewear with her. So she would not have voluntarily left without being able to see. Upstairs to their master bedroom, the room had been ransacked with his wife's underwear strewn about the floor. The bed covers had been pulled off of the bed. Jewelry box had been gone through. But he couldn't tell if the system is missing from the home office. And in the bonus room, he discovered that his telescope was missing. And there were pornographic magazine photos pinned up on the walls inside the room. Who does stuff like this? It's just not normal. I, my career, I've never seen a burglary where something like this was ever done. Every person that started working on the case had to begin focusing on Lori Kirkley, what she liked. Could she have possibly run away? It's very rare for a random stranger to commit a crime against another person. Who is it's some a close associate of the person that's been harmed. You start off with. The husband, of course, anytime some a, a wife goes missing, you have to first determine is the marriage in good shape, were there any problems? And that had to be done in this case. That day, I had seen Lori come home from work like always. I remember that. And then I remember her going inside and the driver's seat backing out of the driveway. I do not remember seeing anyone else in the car with her. The police asked me if I had seen anything weird. And I had told them that the day before, my best friend and I went outside. It had just stopped raining. And I had seen a man riding a bicycle. He rode right past us, and he was wet. We were like right here, standing at the end of the driveway. He went to figure he was doing laps for about an hour. He didn't stop. He didn't smile. He didn't wave. When he rode past, I would say he was no more than 10 feet away from us. The mystery just intensified. 
Investigators found that another burglary had occurred there in February of 1999, and it was not an ordinary run-of-the-mill burglary. It was very, very strange. Someone broke into the Kirkley's house and left things, and there were some items taken, but it was not a, a rational taking of valuable property, just some random things. Her clothing, uh, underwear, drawer was gone through. So does this make any sense? When does a burglar break into somebody's house to leave things in the house? At the scene, Robert seemed like he was beside himself about, you know, what had happened with her. But at that point, we couldn't clear him of any involvement in his wife's disappearance. We were looking for more evidence from the butter knife with the blood on it and the note conveniently left by the front door to make it look like it was a planned, direct hit burglary. That's not how they're done. They don't come looking for a women's lingerie and take a TV and a VCR. It's looking like something nefarious has happened with Lori. Just one rumors, the speculation that perhaps Robert was the mastermind behind Lori's disappearance. I remember wanting to defend Bob. Big one. I never once thought that he was the one that would have hurt Lori. Something like this just doesn't happen in Valparaiso, Indiana. And there were a lot of people speculating another man or whatever, and it was very painful to listen to it. I would just tell people, you are, you're nuts. You don't know what you're talking about. I said, you don't know, Lori. I said, just stop, because those rumors are just rumors. They're not true. I didn't know what had happened, but I know what didn't happen, because I knew Lori. Lori and her husband, Robert, who we called Bob, were our neighbors. They loved each other dearly. There was never, ever any doubt in my mind about that. Bob had received a promotion. It was a new chapter of their life. They were getting ready to start a family. That was very exciting news for us because we all thought that Lori would make the best mother. I think Lori made this a couple weeks before she was abducted um, because we had had a 4th of July party and it was right before they were ready, they were getting ready to move. Herb, Deb, and Bethany, thank you for having us all together for the 4th of July. It was great fun. We appreciate all you did to put on such a fun event. 4th of July party it was to celebrate the 4th of July, but um, we were also throwing it because we knew Bob and Lori were m moving, and this was probably the last, you know, neighborhood get-together they were going to be able to attend. So it was, it was a, you know, it was a neighborhood party, but it was also a, a way to say goodbye to Bob and Lori and thank them for being great neighbors. It never came to our mind that she would take off and just not show up for work and leave her husband and not leave a message and no, that was fucked. And, um, you know, trying to maintain, you know, I'm sure wrecking his brains, trying to think of what could have happened where she was. Friends and family members came over to the house to try and help, give him support. He just looked kind of lost and, didn't know what to do. I did not think that Robert could have harmed her. 
I thought that they had a loving relationship. And uh, I didn't really know Robert very well, but his bar foreboding, evilness, you know, bad will, control. So I didn't really get that from him. Anybody who was reading the newspapers understood that something gravely wrong had happened uh, and that things were not looking good for Lori. Thinking back how crazy the crime scene was, and I, Lori Kirkley was an avid cyclist. She belonged to a bicycle club called the Crank Club. She was the president of the Crank Club, in fact. The police found out that Lori Kirkley's neighbor saw a bicyclist near her house that looked suspicious. Um, police took this information and investigated it. When you're working a case like this, you always look at close family members, significant others. We were running down hot leads. We contacted members of the club problems with or any issues club members may have had with anybody. One was Samuel Montgomery. We were told that Samuel was going through a pretty nasty divorce, that his wife and her new boyfriend were also members of the crank club. And Samuel had thought that the club members were taking sides in their personal battles he had a lot of anger issues going on at the time this kind of came to a peak at one point he even was accused of trying to drive lori being the president she had to file a formal complaint report with the club on samuel and what happened that day was samuel the strange man riding through the neighborhood on a bicycle interviewed Samuel about the incidents. He admitted that during the time of his divorce that he was being a jerk, and he admitted to what had whatsoever against Lori. She did what she had to do. He was also able to provide us with an alibi witness to account for his whereabouts during the time frame that Lori disappeared. So at that point, he was no longer a probable suspect. In the course of interviewing Samuel, he did tell us that there was another member named William Johnson that we should probably take a look at. He told us that he knew of Johnson making a very off-color comment to one of the female members of the club. In interviewing other members of the club, we were given the same information that at one point she wanted to masturbate with him and then approached a second female in the club and asked her how her crotch felt after a long ride. Because of those statements and his behavior in general, he was terminated from the club. That right away kind of piqued our interest because you have a guy who's making all these outright bold sexual innuendos to these women. We began getting tips from all over this area. There's one woman who lived in the same apartment complex as William Johnson came forward and said that William had approached her and asked if she would contact police and give a false alibi for him as to his whereabouts on the night of Lori's disappearance. So that right away catapulted William Johnson to the top of our people of interest list. In 1999, I was a staff nurse in the cardiac rehab department with Lori. 
Well, it was a smaller department, so we worked very closely together, along very well. She was very well schooled. She very much knew what she needed to know to do an excellent job in her capacity as a cardiac rehab nurse. At the time, there were six secretary, and then we had an exercise physiologist, David. We asked him for help when we were busy. Sometimes we didn't get help. <laughs> Sometimes he had a, got real friendly and would help us, you know, do things, joke around together. But I had a feeling that, you know, maybe on Thursday, July 22nd, I was getting ready for work. My coworker called and she said, I just want to let you know before you come in that Lori is missing. I wanted to know what was going on. And it was a helpless feeling because you have no idea what could have happened, where she was. The police were asking us a lot of questions and so we were going back in our minds. They asked me when was the last time I saw her. It was before the first exercise class of the afternoon, I guess, and Lori had a strange look on her face. She kind of like stared at me. Like when you can't say something, but you are trying to say something with your eyes. And I said, is it that guy again that's messing with you? And then she just kind of turned around and didn't, didn't respond. There was a lot of times when Lori would say there was something missing. Did you see this? Uh, I had it setting out here, but it was gone. Somebody was toying with her, like just trying to make her. If William Johnson was this person that a lot of people in the bike club pointed to and said, hey, this guy's weird. He's done some weird stuff towards the women in the bike club. We're uncomfortable with him. You should probably talk to William Johnson. He appeared really nervous when he was talking with us. He indicated that he had quit the club the previous November, that he hadn't seen Lori since May of that year. He had no information whatsoever about her. He couldn't offer any information where he was, what he was doing, or anybody who could validate where he was. But um, there is no evidence that he had ever been at the Kirkley residence. So we went on to just keep an eye out for related evidence that had to do with him. The note found at the house come across as a potential clue that there may have been some realtors involved, Norm Jacobs, at their brokerage to discuss the case. Our detectives went and they interviewed both gentlemen. And as executives of the company, they really don't know who all their listings are with as a pretty good-sized brokerage. They never heard of the Kirkleys. They didn't even know that they had the house listed with them. Both men were able to give us alibis for where they were on the night of the disappearance. And we were given access to his computer and printer to compare it against the letter that was found at the house. When the comparison was done with the letter and the printing off, one had anything to do with this case in any way, shape, or form. So now the question becomes is why would somebody go through this much trouble to stage a burglary and a potential kidnapping. While Robert Kirkley was being interviewed by detectives, the Fort County Sheriff had notified us of the burned out remains of what appeared to be a Ford SUV in this cornfield here. From the very beginning, Law enforcement's got an all-points bulletin, so to blue if they can find that. 
there was no plate on it, and the VIN number had been obliterated in the fire. One of our investigators, who also happened to be an arson guy, came out here, and he noticed right away the burn pattern inside the vehicle that was indicating that an accelerant had been used. In examining the area, they found a gas can that had melted down in the fire. So they began checking the area for a potential body, which they didn't find. The car was later examined, and they found the hidden VIN numbers on the vehicle, and they positively identified it as having been Lori's vehicle. What does this mean? Is he trying to lead investigators astray, or is this a clue that Lori was actually murdered using a firearm? The person responsible for this abduction is leaving notes, taunting investigators, taunting the victim's family, and he's gone yet again and done something more. He's gotten rid of the vehicle, burned it up, and left it for investigators to find. How did this happen? How is someone in our community still out there able to drive a vehicle out to a cornfield and burn it up, a vehicle that everyone you know, for miles around is looking. On my way home from posting missing persons flyers, I got a phone call from our secretary, and she said that Lori's car had been found and that it was burning. I just wanted to know if she was inside, and our secretary said no. So I was somewhat relieved. And in the meantime, our co-worker, David, had called and talked to my 13-year-old daughter to find out if I had heard anything. So when I got home, I called David, and I told him her car had been found, and he said, oh, he said, That's, that doesn't sound very good. It could still be safe. I'd been a reporter at that time for 12 years, and I ended up being a crime reporter for 10 more years. This case really captivated the community. I couldn't go anywhere without being asked about that, and that was unique. Tips were coming in by the dozens, if not the hundreds. Uh, they'd get a report of a foul odor here, uh, something, a suspicious noise that somebody found. But when you see the area where her vehicle was found burned, this was maybe solve this case. And then they get an additional break in the case. So here I am sitting, you know, in the living room as a kid, 12 years old. My mom asked me to take out the trash. I mean, I remember being really annoyed by that because I just wanted to go play with my friends. And so I grabbed the trash and went out to the dumpster. And as I was turning, I looked down. I saw a Ziploc bag. And as I was throwing it away, out of the corner of my eye, I saw um, the envelope. And I remember just dropping the bag. And then I kind of stood there for a second. And I looked down at it again. And I realized, like, there's something wrong with this. This was the note that was in the envelope that I found. So this is my first time reading this. It says, Dear Mr. Kirkley, I'm very sorry about your wife. She came home in the process of the robbery. She would not cooperate even with a 44 Magnum pointed at her head. When I tackled and attempted to cover her mouth, she bit the tip of my finger off too. You will never find the body Tell the cops the case is closed. That's terrifying. My mom didn't really want me to know what significance there really was to me finding, you know, a letter by a dumpster. I was in seventh grade. I don't think I really knew that there was that kind of evil in the world. This is the apartment complex where a young man found a plastic bag that was set next to the dumpster. First thing he might inside the bag were personal items that belonged to Lori Kirkley. 
the keychain that would have had the key to her missing explorer on it, and a bike shoe that belonged to her. These two items were shown to Robert Kirkley, and he identified them as belonging to Lori Kirkley. So we know this is a letter that was written by the real abductor saying what happened to Lori Kirkley. She's dead. Give up on this investigation. You'll never find the body. You'll never solve this case. There were no fingerprints found on the bag. Detectives canvassed the apartment complex. Note that. And that pretty much left us back with no leads. To me, the person who was doing all this was trying to control us. And it was almost like whatever this person was saying to us, um, we just had to take it as gospel. With so many unanswered questions, it was decided that we needed to bring the persons close to Lori back in for further questioning. Her husband, Robert, was brought in, and he volunteered to submit himself to a polygraph test. The person came. Uh, which goes to suggest uh, deception. I have no idea whether he was trying to control his breathing or whether he was just terribly worried about his wife. Right? But as I understand it, uh, he failed the polygraph. At the conclusion of the interview, it was determined that it was physically impossible for him to have been at the home during the time sequence that this would have happened. Polygraphs are imperfect. That's why the courts don't recognize them as evidence. They measure changes in a person, really distraught and upset about what happened to Lori, which affects those biological functions. At that point, Robert was cleared of any suspicion in the case. The break in the case comes when a woman reports that she knows the person that did the first burglary. When the lady came in the front door, I immediately recognized her as one of my kids. She told investigators that she discovered the missing items inside her house, the TV, the VCR, and the camera that had been taken. That was the break in the case that we'd been waiting for. Pretty amazing for the lady to do that, turn her husband in. Investigators obtained a search warrant. Police searched the entire home, but they didn't find tangible evidence. It wasn't until one of the investigators was jogging by that he saw a pitch and realized that the reason they hadn't discovered that pitch was because not only was it a secret room, there was also a secret entrance. Up there, and I looked around at the walls. It's covered with pornography images. And they're cut out and pasted on that wall, very similar to the way the pictures were pasted in that collage that was left in that original burglary of Lori Kirkley's house. We'd identified the lead suspect. He wasn't a cyclist. He was a co-worker of Lori Kirkley that worked side by side with her. He was a man named David Malinsky. The people she worked with, they didn't see this dark side of Malinsky, but it was there. We have to track him down immediately. David Malinsky was brought in for questioning he was a co-worker of Lori Kirkley's at a heart rehab center. He was an exercise physiologist in the same location where Lori Kirkley was a nurse. He was in a position to watch her, know where she lived, know what she was doing at various times. And he told investigators that he was responsible for the first burglary at Lori Kirkley's house and that they had been involved in an affair. Can you explain to me what the perp think you're having an affair? Break up the marriage. So that's what you wanted to occur? That's what she wanted to occur. 
David begins to spin a pretty amazing story. He told our investigators that he and Lori had been having an affair for roughly six months together. What was it that brought the two of you together? She said she wasn't happy in her marriage. It was more of a physical relationship than anything. I still love my wife. He was trying to suggest that she's the type of person that would run away from home, that didn't love her husband, and said she was dissatisfied with her life. And Lori loved Robert. They had a loving relationship. And she was very dedicated to family. David claims that together the two of them had planned and done the two burglaries at the house to set the stage for the abduction of Lori in July. But he just couldn't leave home that he wasn't ready to do that. What was to occur next? We had a little spat. We had a little argument based upon me going or not. You're talking about leaving your wife. She said she was going to have just take off. She tell you where she's going? Not really. During the interview with David, investigators observed a Band-Aid on his right middle finger. When they removed the Band-Aid and looked, they were able to see what appeared to be human bite marks on his finger. And the note that was left by the dumpster said that Lori had bitten off the end of his finger in the struggle. Did you bring any harm to Lori? No, I didn't. Any physical harm? No, sir. Do you know where Lori is now? I do not. Malinsky is arrested. Initially, we have to make the big decision. Let's go forward and charge someone with murder without the body of the victim. When I got the phone call that he was arrested, of course, I was shocked. And then I thought, can they be wrong? But looking back on it, of course, David was the one that had been messing with her at work. It's the only person that makes sense. While in jail, David shared with two inmates that if the police got hold of him that he was going to be dead. David learned a lesson. There's no honor among thieves after he told the two cellmates about the photographs they came straight to us and then that led us to find the photographs the photographs showed a woman that was bound and was being sexually abused inside david malinsky's master bedroom she was identified as Lori kirkley by her husband we took the photos back and we turned them into a pathologist and based on his best was extremely powerful evidence that even without the recovery of Lori's body proved that Lori had died. Lori's supervisor who testified at the trial that David Malinsky had jealousy and anger towards Lori about her being able to do things at work that he was turned down for, not getting that opportunity to work for a promotion, and Lori was, and he was angry towards Lori about that. And that was why he broke into her house, to scare her, to punish her. Malinsky. But I did. I was terrified because I had to testify that he was the man I had seen riding a bike in front of Lori and Bob's garage. This thing took a lot of planning, from swiping the garage door opener and cloning him to leaving his pickup truck at the gas station around the corner, riding the bike up to the house and wait for her arrival. When she came home, he overpowers her, somehow restrains her, puts her back before all the other uh, horrible events in the case occur. Now, 
And I walked down the steps at the end of the trial. I was happy that we'd done everything we could up to that, to that point, but we still wanted to recover Lori's body for her family. Her family needed to have that answer. David hadn't granted any interviews at that point, but I felt that since we had gone to college together, that he the conversation. He said that he had the evil spirit in him, that he had since kind of gotten a handle on by turning to God. I think he wanted to confess, but I think he wanted to keep the hope of an appeal alive. So David refused to tell where Lori was buried. In 2005, his conscience becomes more and more difficult. And at some point, he comes to the determination he has to tell the truth. The investigator is out to his father's property. It was a rural property, pointed to a spot. They dug and found her five feet under the ground. And the autopsy showed that she died of strangulation. She was able to be taken back home and put to rest near her parents and her other relatives. It was a very dark case. The profilers told us that just looking at everything as past history and the way this was done, they felt that if we hadn't have caught him, that he would have gone on to potentially become a serial killer. And it's very sad, you know, that somebody could be just taken like that when they were trusting of an individual and came to work 40 hours a week with somebody. That's the real disconcerting thought that somebody that you consider a friend, a coworker, could have been so dark and evil. It's really scary. I think my dad described Lori the best. He used the word effervescent. All these years later, 21 years later, always just stuck with me. Um, she was always happy.